On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, writer and best-selling author, Pamela Ribbon. I like to do uh, surprising characters. I like comedy that has a little bit of heart, might make you sad at some point. I like the sound when an audience goes, <laughs> like when they, when they don't want to cry, when they, I like that. And then when the laughter goes into tears, I mean, that, you know, that's her favorite emotion. Like it's a real, it's a real thing. In this episode, writer and best-selling author Pamela Ribbon discusses writing the Disney films Moana and Ralph Breaks the Internet. A lot of Disney product is done out of um, books that ex IP that existed already, and this was a story that wasn't a storybook. You know, it wasn't something that we were all familiar. Uh, with. Well, the directors, it's a director-driven studio, so they have these areas and ideas of what they'd like to explore. And so for Ron and John, it was it was Polynesia, and specifically these myths. You know, that is it is fairy tales and mythology, right? So it's still, but it's just of this culture. They also were very interested in the Great Migration where for about a thousand years, the, these navigators stopped looking for new islands. They found Fiji and then that was it. And it took a thousand years before Tahiti. And it was like, you know, they still don't know. Was it, you know, a climate change or was it like, this place is real pretty. <laughs> I think we're good here in Fiji. Um, or was it uh, because of this one girl's dream and her destiny to reunite the islands? So a lot... I guess was written about, or has been written, or may still be being written about the Disney princess in Moana, who is not a princess at all, but a chief. And then all of the prior princesses, but there were a couple before, like Merida and Elsa, right, or, who were not really quite as traditional. They're not in love with men um, as part of the primary role in the film. Uh -huh. um, she doesn't even have a boyfriend, Moana. Well, that was the thing, too. Moana was, well, we knew Moana wasn't going to have a love interest. Um, her love is the sea. And, you know, at some point then it was, is she a, is she a princess? This is the, the, at the same time, because of the way these work, these movies work, we're all um, jumping on each other's movies for these screenings. So every like two or three months, you you screen your film, and then you get notes from 450 people, and then you tear it down and you start all over again. You're like, I, yeah, I don't know what we were thinking. I'm so sorry, and you start over again. <laughs> and uh, so that was deep in the Moana process when we uh, they were having a, a conversation about uh, what the Wreck-It Ralph sequel could be, and I had gone in, met with them, and I just was thinking like, why isn't Vanellope canon? Like she is my kind of princess. And also there's that coronation that happens at Disneyland where they determine who's a princess and gets to be a princess. And there was discussion whether or not Moana would become a princess or is she a daughter of a chief? And what is, and I would think a lot of like, then what are the qualities that go into being a Disney princess? As we modernize these princesses and we think of their mythology a little differently, their responsibility to, um, you know, future generations. I thought, well, who better to ask Vanellope what kind of princess are you than, than all of them? That they've all feel like, do you feel, are you defined by your destiny? Are you defined by what happened to you? And this sort of internet knowledge that we, this internet uh, version of them that we've already made with like hipster Ariel and things like that. Like how can we embrace our like, um, our passion and our love for these princesses or even our like, you know, sometimes n not always trusting of like, what, is, what are you trying to sell me here? This one was also different in the sense that I mean, it felt like <clears throat> this was more of a coming-of-age Disney princess. Was that something that you all were working through as you were developing her character? Like, how were you trying to, you know, show her to the world? Yeah, that, well, she started younger. She started at 14, and that made a whole different dynamic between her and her dad. And also our, our feelings of her, like, what she's doing is 
terrifying. And so there, you do have to know that she has some competence. There were versions where she would test, you know, try to go out against the reef and totally fail or that she would try to go out and her dad would stop her before she got too far out and she'd get in trouble. There are versions where she was really, really little and got into danger and grandma would say like, you know, the ocean's not a toy. And so it was really trying to find that place where you, um, you're rooting for her, but she hasn't arced and like she isn't a perfect girl just always moving forward and changing the world she has to she has to come that's how you have, you have to have the coming of age moment or you're just waiting for everyone else to know she's right there's more fish beyond the reef there's more beyond the reef <laughs> seems like most characters, when you're overtly stubborn and you just keep moving forward and moving forward, especially with youthful characters in movies, she just, she seemed like, you know, this was something that was part of who she was and she was going to find this. And I, I thought it was great that she didn't get punished, that she was allowed to, you know, move forward that way, that there wasn't, you know, maybe that was also because it was really her. I mean, I think it was a really interesting choice that you spend half the movie just with her and Maui on this open sea, um, whereas most Disney movies too have so many characters. I mean, it must have been an interesting experience to be writing a film for Disney where there were just so few actually people. And there's, there are no walls. <laughs> like, there's no props. But, the, but yeah, there's nobody can like knock on the door and like, hi, who do you need? But there was also, uh, Maui is a powerful character. He's very charismatic. And, you know, how do you have someone hang with him without him just taking over the film? There were versions where it, would just, it was as if she would just hand the film over to him and be like, this is maybe really your story. Uh, it's, it's compelling because he does have... I mean, he is compelling. But, I, you know, when you said she doesn't get punished, I, the storyteller brain in me went, well, like, in the third act, like, it is, a, she does do a thing that she, you know, there are ramifications and repercussions for her stubbornness. She doesn't get punished by her dad, right? And there were versions early on where she was, like, very much in trouble for the way that she believed. There were times when it was also, like, just realizing where she uh, took up space in the frame. You know, if it looked like dad was talking to her and you were up here where dad's point of view is, you, you kind of didn't think that she had the right to be saying these things. But when she filled the frame, she was the hero of her movie. And then you were rooting for her. I will talk to the council. I'm sure what we could... we fish beyond the reef? No one goes beyond the reef. I know, but if there are no fish in the lagoon... Moana, and there's a whole ocean... We have... One rule. An old rule when there were fish. A rule that keeps us safe Dad, instead of endangering our people. So you can run right back to the water. The other really interesting thing I found about her was that she felt more like a CEO than a kid at times. Because <laughs> because Maui was a narcissistic, you know, demigod and she, she manipulated him. And so that, again, wasn't something I was used to seeing, you know, in a, in a Disney film, which that character having that kind of strength. I think it was a lot of trying to make sure you weren't telling a familiar version of a, of a, she was not a damsel in distress, even if she was a, a girl with a problem. And, um, you know, because you've got this big, strong guy coming in, like already saying you're welcome. Right. So how, how do you, you know, you've got to be a little on like, she's going to be clever here. You know, when there were versions when she was, uh, so excited to meet him, like you knew she was going to get hurt. You know, it just, you just didn't trust this relationship at all. Um, and so he, she really had to have a lot of power. It's actually Maui shapeshifter, demigod of the wind and sea, hero of men. I interrupted from the top, hero of men. Go. Uh, I am Sorry, 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 sorry. And women. Men and women. Both. All. Not a guy-girl thing. Uh, you know, Maui is a hero to all. You're doing great. What? No. 
I'm here too. Oh, of course, of course. Yes, 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 yes. Now he always has time for his fans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you use a bird to write with, it's called tweeting. <laughs> I know, not every day you get a chance to meet your hero. You are not my hero. And I'm not here so you can sign my oar. I'm here because you stole the heart of Tefiti. And you will board my boat, sail across the sea, and put it back. You all created this thing called the Oceanic Trust. Yeah, uh, Oceanic story. Trust. Trust. Yeah, yes. what, what was that? What was this? And how did it play into the development of this story? This was uh, scholars and, and linguists and academics who we would, we would consult with all kinds of things. We, you know, we wanted to be um, respectful and, you know, that was, that was the most important thing, that it was authentic and respectful. We did a lot of research and um, would talk to them about things. So they were involved in the process of development, like, all through, and you had people from all over the world that were part of that? The yeah, all of the Polynesian. Of, yeah. I'm sure it got more detailed as it got closer to, um, we're recording this line, you know, <laughs> Yeah. than where I was more in the, um, does this feel good to you? You know, are we, is this a Maui that is okay? You know, because every island has kind of a different mm -hmm. take on him, uh, but he's important. How does research fit into either spoiling or making a better story? Well, it can do it can do both. I'll, t I'll tell Moana story. So uh, we're in Polynesia. We're we're presenting what we're doing, and uh, there's a scene where Moana to show her grandmother that she had uh, really gotten good at, at navigating and sailing was going to climb a coconut tree and bring her the farthest coconut from the island. And they were like, oh, she can't, she can't climb a coconut tree. That's not, she wouldn't, she just wouldn't. You can't and you wouldn't, like a girl wouldn't do that. And I was like, well, what if, like I was just, like, I didn't want to lose this moment. It's great. It was like the original, like, it was a version of when you knew that Grandma Tala had passed away. And so it was like, well, what if, what if it's like an important thing that her grandmother has asked her to do? And it's like her last request. She was like, she wouldn't, she wouldn't do it. You don't do it. I said, okay, what if she's alone on an island? <laughs> and it's the only food source. And she has to climb the coconut tree to get the coconut. And this woman went, she would wait. <laughs> and I was like, mm, mm, that's it. And you know, you find another way to do this thing that you can get that same feeling. You want that, you want that feeling of when the, the manta ray breaches her boat, how do you get that feeling? And does it really matter whether or not she's holding a, a coconut or how can, can you just, how can you get to that moment anyway? You're a long ways past the reef. Grandma? Guess I chose the right tattoo. Grandma! <sighs> I tried, Grandma. I... I couldn't do it. Have you had the alternate? Like, so that's something that you ended up putting into a story that you weren't even thinking about doing, and it made it for you a better experience? We went to the Griffith Park Observatory when it was shut down, and they... Uh, they said, they just put us in the room, the story, or the story team, and they said, uh, when did Moana set sail? And I had been working on like what time of year it would be with the currents and stuff, because at the time it was a certain, that was the thing she had to go because of a certain current. So we knew the time and they went to their computer and they were like, and the stars filled the whole planetarium. And they said, so that's what the sky looked like the night she set sail. So pick her star. And I was like, <laughs> Like, you go, like, every time I tell that story, because it's like, come on, that's crazy the, to have this kind of access. But also to just, like, when, when, when science and research and an expert really gets to impress you with what they know, it's, it's great. It's, it's beautiful. It's like getting to be in the movie for a second. You have become the person, certainly in the animated world, to create strong female characters, right? Or odd, also odd. different, <laughs> odd, strong female characters. I think characters. I started with odd, and then they were like, odd lady. <laughs> oh, she's an odd lady who's funny. That's what I'll give you. But yes, I like to do uh, surprising characters. I like comedy that um, you know, has a little bit of heart, might make you sad at some point. Like an, I, I, like the, I like the sound when an audience goes... <laughs> Like when, when they don't want to cry. Is there a name for that emotion? 
Mm. Mm. End of act two. <laughs> <laughs> so, Vanellope, you really doubled down on Vanellope for sure. <laughs> um, because she came, she was tough, you know? And yeah. so, so can you talk about, and the people that you added to that, because there were, again, there were so many characters in that first Wreck-It Ralph. Yeah. yeah. There were so many characters in that film. And then you've got all, them plus a whole new cast of characters yeah. in Breaks the Internet. So how, how did you approach that and, and how they fit into her story of growth there? Rich Moore and Phil Johnston had already known they wanted to take Ralph to the internet. Why, why do a sequel? Why bring these people out again? And they had always thought of, like, when you and your best friend from a small town go to the big city, you think nothing could ever tear you apart. And then you go there, and one of you, like, falls in love with the place, and the other one is like, I can't wait to go home. And, and can we do that to, to these two? And really talk about how friendships change and what insecurity can do. The, the kind of lies you tell yourself and your, and your friend and to try to protect them. Um, and then Vanellope, be, much like Maui, like she's so smart and competent. I'm not saying that Maui is. I'm saying that your secondary character, when she is already kind of like her own woman, but she's not, she's a young girl. So how do you give her a coming-of-age story? And we started to think about, well, if the first Ralph uh, ends with him saying, if, if that kid loves me, how bad can I be? If you really dive into that, that's kind of a codependent statement. You know, he can't revolve around her. What, what's going to happen if she grows up and, and wants something else? And, and not from the beginning, but like had no idea this was a future she could dream. And then how does that feel to know like, I think I want, you know, I think female protagonists are often given like, I want more, right? How many songs was I about to sing? But, but I think that definitive feeling of it's not because I can get more at the end of act one what is what is that thing in act three that I couldn't I could not have known the the world I've unlocked for myself because of this journey I went on and then how can you verbalize that so for Vanellope it was my game broke and I don't know how to feel like I'm a racer ever again I don't know how to feel that moment when I don't know what's going to happen and it's exciting we kind of leaned into like I don't she doesn't even know how to say more and then that is a great place for Ralph to be like, well, I'm great, though. Like, we got me. That's all you need. Um, yeah. And so then, you know, once you're on the Internet, you're, you're, you've got to have a lot of characters. What am I going to do all day? <laughs> Come on. Are you kidding? You sleep in. You do no work. Then you go to Tappers with me every night. I've literally just described paradise. But I loved my game. Oh, come on. You were just bellyaching about the tracks being too easy. No, that doesn't mean I didn't love it. Yeah, sure, it was kind of predictable, but still, I, I never really knew what might happen in a race. And it's that, it's that feeling, that not knowing what's coming next feeling. That's the stuff that, that feels like life to me. And if I'm not a racer, Ralph, what am I? Oh, well, you're my best friend. That's not enough. I didn't really look at it as Ralph's movie. I looked at it as Vanellope's movie. <laughs> and I didn't think of her as the secondary character in that film. Well, they're a partnership. Yeah. But there was a thing, like, is it going to be, is there, a, you know, the early on, like, is it time for Vanellope to have her movie? But, you know, it's, it's Wreck-It Ralph 2. It is Ralph. Like, it is through his opinion of what's going to happen. And for him to learn, to, for him to learn, like, oh, I'm the antagonist. And I'm actually the, the problem here. And I have a choice to make of whether or not to, to keep this girl from her potential or to be the, a better friend. And it's going to really hurt. That was not an easy, you know, that's a weird needle to, to thread before he would sometimes do things that made him unlikable. And to be the antagonist-ish, but to also be the hero, but not her hero all the way through. We were, you know, we wanted her to, to be her own hero too. So you took them to the dark net. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> some parts. Some parts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, was there ever... A, and it gets dark. I mean, the film gets very dark in that space. You know, the many Ralphs and the, just the psychological issues that Ralph has that's created this virus that's really a horrible virus. And that... Was there ever a question about how dark that was getting? We also were like, you can't make a movie about the internet and pretend it's all rainbows and unicorns. Like, that's a little irresponsible, I think, particularly when it's a story about a girl going out on her own on the internet. Like, there are dangers and there are ways that 
the movie can introduce conversations on the ride home with the family, you know. But we also, yeah, we knew, like, we can't, we can't not talk about it or it's like pretending. It's just, it's fake. It wouldn't feel like the internet. It has its good things and it's bad. And it, that's what the internet does. It brings out the best and the worst in you, right? Um, whether or not you're feeling anonymous or emboldened with the crowd. It takes the two movies for Ralph to become a better person, right, for him to really evolve. And for this, when you meet Vanellope, uh, at the end of the first movie, she's um, broken out of the place she was in, but it takes that second movie for her to truly be free. And so that, then you were asking, when you are saying, oh, I don't think of it as a secondary character, I guess it's because for us, you're right, it, it is a two-hander as much as possible, but it is like the story of, of Ralph, ultimately, over the two films. We're going to talk about the Disney princess scene that showed up in Ralph Breaks the Internet. It was a very odd place to have all these Disney prin- Surprising, very surprising. Surprising. And, yeah. and more surprising that you are Snow White. Uh-huh. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, um, I just did a little, busted a little Calhoun. But I, uh, we, because of our improv nature and how we work, we do a, a lot of scratch, like four of us in the room so that we can rewrite and then also an edit. <clears throat> and so I'm most of the female characters when we're just doing all these screenings. So when I first brought in the, the, the princess scene, we were like, don't tell anyone, let's just do it. Because I think, we'll, I think it's too easy to say no to the concept. When I wrote that scene um, after the first draft, I genuinely had a small panic attack <clears throat> and like laid on the ground and texted a friend, and I said, I think I might get fired. Like, I don't know what to do. I don't, and I was texting her, like, some of the lines, and she was like, uh, just, like, emojis, like, I love everything about this. And I was like, you have to tell me if, because she's a true Disney, like, in her soul. She's my Wikipedia, as I called her. But she, I was like, you have to tell me if this is not okay. And she was like, I think this is okay. Um, and yeah, and I brought it in. They were like, we're just going to board it, and we'll see what happens. So because of that, I was all of... Uh, princesses for quite some time before we started talking all the actresses into uh-huh. coming back. Once they were like, and when we're gonna, like the whole thing got crazy when they were like, and we're gonna get all the original Disney princesses, and I'm like, what? Like I'm turning into a Kristen Wiig character, like, oh my god, you got Ariel. <laughs> so oh, the original Snow White is no longer with us, and so at, at that point they had been animating because we were going to D23 with this. We were like, well, let's test it out in front of every super fan. Uh, I'm a princess, too. Wait, what? Yeah, Princess Vanellope Von Schweetz of the uh, Sugar Rush Von Schweetzes. I'm sure you've heard of us, so it'd be embarrassing for you if you haven't. (laughs) What kind of a princess are you? What kind? Do you have magic hair? No. Magic hands? No. Do animals talk to you? No. Were you poisoned? No. Cursed? Cursed? No. Kidnapped or enslaved? enslaved? No. Are you guys okay? Should I call the police? Then I have to assume you made a deal with an underwater sea witch where she took your voice in exchange for a pair of human legs? No. Good (gasps) lord, who would do that? Have you ever had true love's kiss? Ew, barf! Do you have daddy issues? I don't even have a mom. Neither do we! And now for the million dollar question. Do people assume all your problems got solved because a big strong man showed up? Yes, what is up with that? She She is a princess. (laughs) It was a huge hit for a scene though, right? Yeah, it broke the internet as they say. (laughs) Yes, it went well. I mean, there is that, this is the thing, like I had gone, I've written things that have gone viral. I'm a little like, you can tell, you know, when something's gonna catch on. How much deep diving did you have to do going into the concept of the uh-huh. internet, you know, of taking these characters inside the internet? What did you... You mean for... You're not talking about just the princess scene now? You mean... No. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. well, that was his own thing, right? You have uh-huh. all these tropes. And then I called my friend. I was like, which ones were captured? And she's like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> like, just want... Which ones have daddy issues? And so... So that I had the right people saying the right things. But that's the same thing with uh, the internet. Once we were sort of... I don't know, once you could, once we had kind of a layout of how the internet should feel and we were able to find comps of like, okay, well, eBay might feel like a big auctioneer house. Then it's like I said, like you don't have walls. Now suddenly you have some walls and you can start to picture what kinds of uh, conversations they can have in there, where the fun can be. You've been watching a conversation with Pamela Ribbon on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story Project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program, the On Story podcast, and the On Story book series, available where books are sold. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. 